And what this represents is the entire universe. We're offering up the entire universe. That's right. And then there will be a part in the chant where you'll hear a Sanskrit mantra, and all we do is let go of that, and then just bring our hands into prayer mudra, and then that's basically it. But um, let's do it in English. You guys have it in English? Oh, you want to start us off? Yeah. Here is the great earth filled with the smell of incense, covered with a blanket of flowers, the great mountain, the four continents, wearing a jewel of the sun and the moon. In my mind, I make this a paradise of a Buddha, and I offer it all to you. By this deed, may every living being experience the pure world. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Nireyatayami. We go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha until we achieve enlightenment. By the power of the goodness that I do, in giving and all the rest, may I reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. We go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha until we achieve enlightenment. By the power of the goodness that I do, in giving and the rest, May I reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. We go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha until we achieve enlightenment. By the power of the goodness that we do in giving and the rest, may we reach Buddhahood for the sake of every living being. I think we should do a little meditation to start. All right. Could start the recording. Okay. So relaxing, eyes closed. Just take a few moments to use what you have to bring your mind in, and that is your body and that is your breath. Your body, your physical body and your breath, they're always in the moment. So you can use those things to actually bring the mind into the moment. So let's start by first of all, sitting very relaxed, taking an in-breath and using that in-breath to draw the crown towards the sky and then keeping that nice reaching of the crown as you then exhale and relax your shoulders and have a sense that your heart is open and lifted and ready. Your hands are relaxed wherever they may be so that you don't have to be concerned about your hands. jaw is relaxed, gentle smile is good, gentle smile is very relaxing, relax your eyebrows, and then using the body a little more by noticing the sensation of breath. So feel your breath as it fills your belly. And leaves your belly and just notice it and enjoy the sensation and not don't try not to label it or try not to control it. Just let it be as it is and experience it. Using the sensation, the physical sensation, to draw your mind fully here.
And now let's take a moment to move to a more subtle object, draw the mind up, and start to focus on the tips of your nostrils and begin to watch the breath as it passes on the exhale and passes on the inhale. But you keep your mind parked, focusing at the tips of your nostrils, and simply watch the breath as it passes. Now begin to think of your teacher, whoever that may be for you, and if you don't have quote unquote a teacher right now in your life that you would call a teacher, then call to mind someone who appears to be a holy being for you in some way. That may be a person from history. There may be someone in your life that's been very influential, someone who you admire or have qualities that you'd like to emulate. Whoever it is, put them in front of you and have them appear floating in midair before you. And they're sitting in meditation pose. And they're very happy that you have thought of them and that you see them. When you think that this being has qualities that you would like to possess in yourself, maybe they're very wise, maybe they're very kind, maybe they never get impatient, maybe they're always joyful, maybe you see them as totally enlightened. Whatever it is, You're going to make mental prostrations to those qualities. So in your mind, you bow down to them. And as you're bowing down to them in your mind, you see them watch over you lovingly joyfully, only wanting your happiness. And you get this sense that they know that it's not for them. They don't need your prostration. They love you so much that they recognize the act of gratitude and the act of Humbling yourself is very beneficial for you. And so that is what makes them happy. And then in your mind, you make them some kind of offering. Offer them something that you think they would like. If they're your official quote-unquote teacher, then what they really like to get from you is your practice. So you could offer them your efforts to practice what they've taught you. You can offer them flowers, sunsets, food, whatever it is, a beautiful song. Just make them some kind of offering. And then tell them something, confess something to them. It's nice to think that they know your mind anyways. It's only for you to get it off your mind, so to purify it, to get it out in the open, 
Just tell them something that you wish you had done differently. And notice that they don't change in their love for you. Their love remains the same. And then tell them something that you're happy about, that you've done in the last little while, rejoicing in your good deeds. And then tell them something that someone else has done that you think is great. You're rejoicing in the good deeds of others as well. So you tell them about something that you've seen someone else do that you think is beautiful. And then ask them to stay. Ask them to please stay and keep teaching you. Stay around until I'm done, until I see myself complete. And ask them to teach you. Say, please teach me in ways that I can understand. However it is that you decide to teach me, may it be clear for me. Even if it may appear unpleasant, maybe if it appears like something that I may be dissatisfied with, may even that be clear to me that it's a teaching for me. Sometimes it's nice to add in here at this point a special request. Like for instance, you may want to ask them, please teach me and keep teaching me how to keep seeing you. Please teach me how to have a mind that continues to see teachers and continues to see something higher that I can aspire to so that I can keep going higher. So you're sort of telling them that if, uh, if all I see is flatline, well, where am I going to go? Please teach me how to see high and holy beings. And then you ask them one more thing. Please help me understand the ideas of today's class. We're going to study Master Shanti Deva today. Please help my mind be soaked with his wisdom, with his teachings. And your teacher, whoever they may appear to be, of course, always agrees. And then see them then shrink down to about the size of your thumb right in front of you. And then they float towards you, spin around in the air, and then land upon your crown facing the same way that you are. You feel the weight on your crown of their blessing. And then they dissolve into light and they just disappear through your crown and reappear again in your heart and now they're living inside of you in your heart you can feel them there and then just to make it complete you have this little wish in your heart that comes from their heart through to your heart that says May just this small little meditation benefit everybody. May these thoughts that I've had towards a holy being be a great benefit to all beings. And this light bursts out of your heart 
fills your body extends out to all beings like a blast of a camera light flash touches everyone in a single instant blessing them making them happy somehow easing their suffering and then the light draws back into you and rests in your heart and then when you're ready you can just slowly gently open your eyes karma of doing a meditation like that is insane I must tell you it's um, it's uncountable you can't these teachings you know um, those are like the preliminaries those were something that we're supposed to do before we even meditate and if you have any kind of understanding of uh, karma and emptiness then by now you may have gotten a glimpse of the <laughs> far-reaching power of that simple little flow that has the power in and of itself to change your whole reality to change your whole self to change how you see the world and how you experience your body however you experience it it's complete it's a complete practice within itself it can bring you everything. It, it blows me away every time. It's true. And if you've been meditating for a while and you find like maybe you've plateaued or maybe you're not, maybe you feel you should be having more, I don't know, fantastic experiences or something. Like if, if there's something that appears to be lacking <coughs> to you in your practice, go back to that. Go back to the, the, seven, the, th the seven limb prayer. Just go back to the preliminaries and make it your whole. Like just each of those steps, just walk through them deliciously. And it will, it will reinvigorate your practice if, if you find it waning or plateauing. It's like anything, right? Like we do anything for a while and we kind of peak and we kind of get a little bored and always go back to the basics. But the preliminaries are important for everything. And we've had a couple weeks off between the first start of these classes and today's. So Lama John's going to do a little uh, debate with you guys to see how much you remember. Okay, Ocon? It's debate style. Debate style. <laughs> debate style. So what you're about to see <laughs> is um, I need a mala. Mm. I need some. I need a mala. So I just have a little one. You need a big one. The one over here, okay, for maybe you should keep yours. You might need to keep yours. <laughs> okay. And did you notice she had it on her left wrist? Yeah, so the yeah. left wrist. You know what that means, Farah, on your left wrist? No. It means well, you're a gunslinger. It, it, it's good. <laughs> in, in Tibetan Buddhism, if you're like walking around the monastery with it around your left wrist, just like you're like, uh, <laughs> you're like, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take on anybody, right? Which, but I'll tell you what it means. According to my. Um, Lama Roger, he says it means you're willing to thrash and be thrashed, <laughs> <laughs> which is what the spirit of the debate is. You're willing to get bludgeoned, right? You're willing. To, you're willing to put yourself out there. So, um, and also to remember that it's yeah. not about making someone else wrong. It's never yeah. about that. It's about taking your combined wisdom and getting to a higher yeah. understanding. So. Let's consider Mishi. She's digging in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we remember we're um, with Master Shantideva right now, right? And he's trying to get us 
to a certain place. So um, let's consider let's consider bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is um, the mind of a Buddha because bodhi is in the word. Bodhi is in the word, so it means it means uh, you're a Buddha. No. No. Takmadru. Takmadru. So just because you're saying just because uh, uh, bodhi is in the word bodhicitta, it doesn't mean you have the mind of a Buddha. Is that what you're telling me? Is that what you're telling? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Make up your mind. Is that what you're telling me? Takmadru. No, it's not, it, it is what it means. So, bo- so bodhi and bodhicitta means you have the mind of a Buddha. So you're done. You don't need bodhicitta because you're done. No. Oh, so you're not done. So now you're saying Dern. no. Dur. So dur. So 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 bodhi and bodhicitta. You're saying does not mean you have the mind of a Buddha already. Is that what you're saying? The bodhi. Takmadru. Oh, it does mean that. So bo- the bodhi and bodhicitta means you already have the mind of a Buddha. So there's nothing to do. <laughs> oh, Takmadru. So, bo- so for body, bo- body and bodhicitta does not mean that you already have the mind of a Buddha. Sir. It means something else. Sir. So you, so no one here. Okay, no, Sevi. Sevi, you cannot tell me what bodhicitta means. Takmadru. You can. Sure. Sure. Bodhicitta is. You're moving, she's moving her chair away. Further away from the action. She is having to wish. You're telling me that bodhicitta means possessing the wish to reach total enlightenment for the sake of every other living being. Yes. I guess so. That's pretty damn yeah, good. Yeah. That was, that was <laughs> you got him. Okay, we got. Yeah. We got. Okay. So. Um, so there is no method to get bodhicitta because everyone has bodhicitta. Everyone's got bodhicitta. No, there's nothing to do. Everyone has it. Everyone has bodhicitta because it's a word. I can say anything. <laughs> it's not giving reasons, you two. You can stick with demons. You can say why. Everyone has uh-huh. bodhicitta because right. it's a Sanskrit word. The word couldn't exist if everyone didn't have it. Talk my group. Oh, so just because just because it's a word that exists doesn't mean everyone has bodhicitta. Sure. So then. You're saying that maybe not everyone has bodhicitta? Sure. Some people do, some people don't. Sure. So people that don't, there's a way to get it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's consider uh, Master Shantideva. Um, and uh, I- the last few classes, we've been talking about ways, some warm-ups, things we have to do in order to get this Bodhicitta. No one here can tell me what one of them is. Because we had two weeks off. We forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Durr. <laughs> yeah, totally. We're talking about the preliminaries, kids. Before you can purify yourself, you have to do certain things. Okay. There is no there. There's there, there's no such thing as an enlightened being. There is such thing as an enlightened being. Um. There's nothing that an enlightened being needs from you. There is something an enlightened being needs from you. Yeah. Oh, this should be good. Okay. <laughs> what, 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 okay, you you can't tell me what an enlightened being would needs from you. To rejoice in your enlightenment. So the enlightened being <laughs> needs to rejoice for you. of your efforts. 
Okay, let's just meeting. let's just we'll pretend for a second that let's just pretend for a second that Farah is an enlightened being. She probably is one. So let's just okay, her cover's blown. <laughs> Farah's an enlightened being. She's looking over at Selva. She she feels this need like oh you know I'm I know I'm enlightened and everything's good but oh she doesn't need anything right now. <laughs> So there's nothing, there's nothing that we do, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing on our altar because uh, there's no such thing as enlightened beings. So since there's no such thing as no enlightened beings, there's nothing on our altar. There is something on our altar. Sure. Offerings. <laughs> Offerings. <laughs> Offerings. So you can't tell me what one of the ways to, to warm up to get bodhicitta is. Even though you just said it, you still can't come. <laughs> you do offerings. Offerings! <laughs> offerings. Oh, oh, here we go. go. <laughs> offerings and prostration. Okay, so now we have offerings, we have prostrations. What comes before all of that? Before you... Okay. You're going towards your altar, you're about to sit down and meditate, and as you're sitting down, you There's no to, point. You call to your lamas? Oh, you call to your lamas. Why? You, you can't tell me why you call to your lamas to help you. Help you. So you 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 have this uh, thing in your mind that you're, you're going to your lamas to. for. You can't tell me what you go to your lamas for. Because you don't need anything from your lamas. When you, when you're. Uh, Okay. So if someone robs your house, you call the doctor. No, I call police. You call the police. <laughs> you call the police because you're not afraid. Because I trust them. You trust them. Oh, I take refuge. Oh, oh you say you're taking refuge. <laughs> <laughs> so no one, even though you just said them, no one can tell me the three things that are the preliminaries to cultivating bodhicitta. Just said it. Take refuge. Take refuge in, in to, to take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And there, yes, nice. So you take refuge, and you also do two other things, which you just mentioned. <laughs> Far, you can't tell me what those two other things are. Offerings and prostration. Offerings of prostration. Got, yes. Nicely done, everybody. That was a little debate. <laughs> <laughs> on, um, the on, warm up uh, for tomorrow. Come, come back tomorrow. Did yeah. Did great. I'm not cold anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I'll tell you. Debate is a great way to um, awesome. Awesome. To just this is great. Like they write the thing, right? That just drives it in, and it's great for memorizing too. Yeah. I remember once I had a debate about, um, I was debating the six steps of Maitreya. And I think, of course, Lama Roger, he always picked on me. And, uh, and I was uh, the same thing, right? I just like freeze. And then I went home and I did a debate in my head. And I, back and forth, back and forth. And I have never, ever forgotten that list of the six steps of Maitreya. It's just there. It's just there. And it, because I was embarrassed in front of my teacher, and then I went and did a little <laughs> thing in my head, Right? And then ground it in. And this really awesome. Yes. Good job. All right. <laughs> Lama John is right. It, you can learn a lot more in, a, in one good debate than in a whole pile of book learning, right? But you need both. And actually, you're not allowed to bring your notes to the debate ground. So. That's where you get bludgeoned. <laughs> you, you get to bludgeon. You get to bludgeon and, and be, be bludgeoned. bludgeoned. <laughs> yeah, you can limp off the debate ground, but wiser, you know. Yeah. So <coughs> actually, you could have called him on something. <laughs> you could have called Lama John on something when he started the very beginning. <laughs> Because Good thing I wasn't debating Sherry. I would have been, <laughs> been bludgeoned. <laughs> no, because the the thing about debate is you have to.
get to common ground to begin with, right? And if you're not on common ground, you could keep that initial part of the debate going until you agree to what you disagree about before you even keep going. And we opened this by saying we're going through the preliminaries. And he started by saying we're going to go through the preliminaries to Bodhicitta, which isn't wrong, but if you recall, the finer point was those classes were about getting to the preliminaries to purification so that you could then cultivate bodhicitta, okay? So we understood from the last class that we really, really, really needed to get to this point where we could clean out all, make, clean up our, clean up enough space so that we could cultivate, we have room for this heart to open up. Bodhicitta meaning this ginormous altruistic love that we can have for all beings. And truly, truly how we manifest that is by getting enlightened first so that we can get everyone else there, right? So this whole purification thing, it's um, really what we need to clean up all of our deep dark pockets of bad karma and what we need so that we have the room, right, to um, collect new good karma. Those are the two things we're trying to do, right? And remember, it's just, karma is just, well, there's a few ways you can slice and dice defining karma. Sometimes they say karma is a movement of the mind, right? Any movement of the mind is karma. They say, in a finger snap, your mind moves 65 times, 64, 65, depending on which ACI course you're listening to. <laughs> and um, they also say that you can think of karma as cause and effect. Karma is actually both cause and effect because every cause has an effect and every effect becomes a new cause, right? So it's all of the above. Now, really, the whole reason we're even here trying to hash out the semantics, trying to hash out the logic, is because we don't want to be unhappy. We want to figure out how to stop our pain and everyone else's pain and how we can all, the greatest equanimity, right, is that everybody, no matter how they think they're going to get there, doesn't want to be unhappy and everyone wants to be happy. We may disagree about the methodology for getting those two things, but you can't deny that no one wants to suffer and everyone wants to be happy, right? So that's what purification allows us to do. So all of those rigorous sort of mental gymnastics we've been going through for the last several classes to figure out what we need to do even to get to the point of being able to purify have, has been for that. And at the very beginning, we need refuge, right? We need to actually think there's something that we need help or saving from and someone or somewhere that we can go to get that. And, you know, they say that you, you do need, especially in Buddhism, you should never ever have blind faith. Actually, in anything, you should never have blind faith. But it does take faith to keep you going. And so what we encourage is logic-inspired faith, experience-inspired faith, because then at a certain point it does take faith, not blind faith, but faith with your eyes wide open so that you can leap, and leap knowing that you are going to find the refuge that you seek, right? So this whole class really now, finally, we're getting to the purification part. And uh, so say to, 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 she. she. That's Tibetan, right, Sevi? Do you know what she is? Have you learned that yet? No. Okay, it's the same. Four. It's the same, actually, in a lot of Asian languages, in Japanese and in Chinese. She means four. It can also mean death, but in this <laughs> case, it means four. And Tob is forces. So this translates to four forces. And we're actually, some of you have already covered, I mean, we've had workshops on purification, we've covered the, so those of you who have taken ACI 5, the karma course, you know, they talk about how to purify um, our, our bad deeds. Oh, and remember also the definition of what makes a karma good or bad? It's not that it's intrinsically good and bad 
from its own side because that's impossible, right? But if it's a bad karma, it results in suffering for you. If it's a good karma, it results in joy and happiness, good things for you, right? So it really is the um, result, the experience that defines whether it's good or bad to begin with. But we know from our studies that there's certain things that will guarantee, remember the four laws of karma, good leads to good, bad leads to bad, like karma is definite, right? Once you um, plant it, you must reap it. If you don't plant it, you can't reap it, and karma grows. I said them in kind of a mixed up order, but those are the four things of cause and effect, right? So, mm, you've heard the, the broad strokes, the, the practical strokes before, but in this class, in Master Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva Ways of Life, he really, really unpacks this for us, gives us the authoritative source right back to Lord Buddha, and um, also gives us a comparison, or Geshla gives us a comparison to what some of the other schools of Buddhism believed. The lower schools, especially the two lower schools, do not believe that you can actually wipe out your karma, your bad karma. And the higher schools believe that you can. Well, they, even they don't say you can actually destroy it, but they do say that you can um, amass enough good karma to never have to worry about your old karma again, your bad karma again, right? They do say there is a way to overcome your bad karma. Whereas the lower school said, forget it, there's no way. So, mm, Master Shantideva, Geshla, everything we've learned from our teachers always says, don't just take our word for it. You have to actually go back to the source. And in this case, the four forces goes back to a sutra. Sutra is something spoken by an enlightened being, right? And so here's the book. Say Chu, Shi. Chu means Dharma, which, um, you know, Dharma can mean a teaching. It can also mean thing, like all, all stuff. Uh, it can mean a spiritual practice. She, what, did, what was she again? Four. Four. And then after that comes Tembe. Tembe. Which means teaches, and mm, this is a hard one. No, no, no. It's like your tongue goes to the top of it. No, so it's like an endio. Means sutra. So this book is called the Sutra, which teaches the four practices. And this is in the Kangyur. The Kangyur is the Buddhist canon that contains what the Buddha originally spoke, what the Buddha originally taught, right? And. Um, the commentary is by Gyaltsabje. Do you guys remember who Gyaltsabje is? It's up on our wall there. Jaitsan Kappa is the head of the lineage of the Dalai Lamas, and he had two spiritual sons, spiritual disciples, Kedrupje and Gyaltsabje, and this is Gyaltsabje. Okay? So, um, Gyaltsabje is commenting on the four forces and in this how lord would have taught this was he actually had a conversation with someone named maitreya you guys heard that name before yeah and remember in some teachings maitreya is the future buddha and in other teachings he's a bodhisattva right a high bodhisattva in this particular case in this sutra where Lord Buddha taught the four forces, he is referred to as a bodhisattva, a student asking questions of the master, right, and getting the answer. So, um, you can also find another source for this particular teaching in the Diamond Cutter Sutra. And the Buddha does clearly say in the Diamond Cutter Sutra that if you do this practice, uh, any karma that might make you go to the lowest of hells, you might experience as just a short headache in this life if you do this practice properly. So, mm, but he also says if you do this practice well, 
you can expect a lot of headaches. Which is a good thing. Because the karma that <laughs> would <think> have <laughs> killed you or maimed you badly <clears throat> or you can list, you know, unlimited suffering. You experience a little headache. Oh gosh, it never ends. It never ends. <laughs> or you're ripening really, really That's well, awesome. right? That's really awesome, Sebi. Yeah. <laughs> Purification, you should actually be <coughs> joyful about it. And it's hard in the moment when your stuff is ripening and you're pure. I had a day of purification today, <laughs> and it's not easy. But if you can recognize it as it's happening, actually, it is cause I to be joyful. I tried what you told us last time with the headache, and my headache did go away. Like, I'm already having a headache. I might as well do <laughs> Rojong and just breathe to everyone's pain and headache and be able to transform it. And it did go away. I mean, I don't know how long it took, but <laughs> I'm just like, I don't It's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. And so the Buddha also said, if nothing disastrous happens in your life, either you're already totally pure, or you're not doing it right. <laughs> so we're going to go through the four forces tonight. And um, yeah. I don't think, you know, it's worth thinking about, you know, that little statement there, you know. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, some, if you do the four forces properly, some act that, you know, could have brought you, you know, thousands of years in some kind of suffering, intense realm could actually shift into like a headache or a toothache or something in this life. And, you know, we hear those things in class and it's like, yeah, yeah, cool, man. But yeah, if, you yeah, sit yeah. And, <laughs> if you sit and think about it for a second, it's quite profound. It's quite profound. And um, if you do manage in the process of taking these courses and, and meditating on what uh, is, is said in the courses, you can get to a very deep understanding of how your life is arising for you via a karma and emptiness. And really, like Sevi said, you're, you can have a completely different view of anything that is quote-unquote you consider as suffering or a negative thing. It's really remarkable. Okay, so here we go. The four forces, the beginning, say Nambar, Nambar, Nambar Sum, Sum, Jinbei, Jinbei, Top. Top. So you're going to hear Top again and again because Top means the force. Okay, and uh, Nambar... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Nambar Sun Jimba is one, one word and actually uh, means like to rip, some, to rip something out. Um, it also can mean like to totally destroy something. So it's got a very powerful connotation to it, right? Um, to deface something or to ruin something. And Geshe-la has trans, uh, translated as the force of destruction. In English so this is the destruction force so you want to get the sense of it's like this very nasty destroying of something that's and it has to have a power that can destroy something right it, some kind of nasty power to just de 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 destroy something nasty <laughs> you know um, so the thing behind the destruction force is called gyupa, gyupa. and gyupa means regret Mm. Okay, and uh, in the scriptures, they describe this gyupa in a certain way, and um, and again, I, I would say that you can't really understand this kind of regret if you don't have a very very good understanding of karma and emptiness, and, and which is why you would understand the ramifications of your actions or whatever it is that you're thinking you you couldn't have an understanding of it and um, and this is like the intelligent regret right um, and I'll quickly tell the story 
because it must be told. <laughs> and it's the famous, is this is the famous story they use in scriptures, and it's like the three guys walking to a bar story, right? And this is, we're trying to describe intelligent regret versus guilt, which the, uh, us Westerners are so, uh, it's an epidemic, right? Guilt over here. So three guys walk into a bar. Let's just say three girls walk into a bar. I'm the only guy here, except for Okar, and he's not going to any bars. So three <laughs> yes. girls walk into a bar, and they walk up to the bartender, and uh, you know, one girl says, you know, give us three shots of that stuff in the brown bottle there. You know, the best whiskey in the house. The bartender pours out three shots of this whiskey. And then they all give cheers and they just go boom, they all down it. Shots. And then shortly thereafter, the person on the far left just goes, ah, and he just falls off, she falls off the bench and just falls on the floor and she's dead. And then the other two are looking over and then the second girl starts going, ah, and then she just falls over and she's dead. And then the third girl suddenly realizes that there's so, there was something, there was some kind of insane poison in this whiskey and that I drank it and this is just about to happen to me. And that is intelligent regret. That's the regret that says, well, I guess I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it's not guilt. It's just a very um, informed, smart regret. Because it, it will harm you. So you're about to be harmed by whatever you've done. And um, we have to become very good at... I, I noticed that someone gave you the book, the pink book, yeah. And that's a great way to becoming very good at beginning to be aware of the thoughts that we're having in our mind d during any kind of conversation. And um, because karma is very subtle. So you're in the middle of some conversation with somebody and uh, maybe, they're, maybe they're annoying you for some reason and they're going on and they won't stop talking. And, uh, and maybe you're not that interested in the subject, but you stay there. And then you start to have these thoughts in your mind about them. And then you start having all kinds of little things like, uh, man, I, I wish they'd just you know, shut up. <laughs> you know, don't, don't they, you know? And then maybe you start having these judgmental thoughts about their character or whatever that is. That, those kinds of thoughts, they create your future reality. So you don't have to say them out loud. And that's how sneaky karma is. And the whole idea about purification is to combat that kind of a thing. Because most of us, we're not in control. I mean, no one's in control. But most of us uh, don't have the capacity to be aware of these kinds of things we're thinking and stop them. That's what the book is for, actually, to become aware of what you're doing during the day. So, because unless, I mean, really, unless you're a very high level kind of practitioner or you've seen emptiness directly or you've gone past a certain stage, most people are having like semi-irritating thoughts all the way through the day or having certain subtle things in their mind and you can't control them. They just pop up and you have like this thought about something or someone or, you, or something pops out of your mouth and you can't control them. You can't stop them. Um, and so what this is what this is all about is to go against those kinds of things and then eventually stop them. Because if you do it enough, it undermines, it undermines the, the momentum behind all that and eventually brings it to a stop so that you actually don't have those kinds of thoughts anymore. But in the meantime, you go through this phase, like Sherry was talking about, um, where you get headaches as you're trying to purify, but you also begin to notice for the first time the crazy thoughts that you're having in your head about your world. And it's not like they're new. 
you think they're new and maybe you think you're going backwards but you're just noticing for the first time this is what this will all do right um, so the intelligent regret means regret that leads to action so okay I did that I'll do something about it regret that leads to action not guilt um, Yeah, I know. Like when I was when I first got into this <coughs> practice, uh, it was really fun because I was doing my book and I was, you know doing it, and uh, all of a sudden, you start doing crazy things. Your friends start thinking you do like because you'll be in the middle of a conversation, and you'll be like, "Yeah, you know." And then he said, and you're like, "Whoa, <laughs> I can't, I can't say anymore. I've already gone too far." And they're like, "What? What did he say? What did he say?" You know, what did that idiot say next, right? And you're like, it's too late already. You've already just set up the whole scene. You want to get some attention by gossiping, and you just have to stop. And you do that enough times, and then your friends start to notice that you're acting differently. Um, I, for myself, I, I would drive. I'd be driving, and then I would, my mind would start to spin, and I would start. I would say no <laughs> out, out loud, and I would uh, hit my dashboard actually, and just as this act of, no, you will not let this train of thought continue. <laughs> and that, I can say, only happened because I was doing the book. There was no way I, I could have been conscious of that. So I, I, I really I believe I owe a lot to that pink book over there. So, so that's the first one, <coughs> intelligent regret, which is destruction. Second one, say tengi. Tengi. Top. 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 What was Pope again? Words. Yeah. This is the foundation force. Whenever you commit a bad karma, it's like you've fallen down. Sometimes they actually call breaking a vow a downfall right? Like the bodhisattva downfalls or because really that that is what you're doing in many ways and you need something solid upon which to push yourself back up again, right? So that's what um, this one is all about. And it really means that um, mm, 10 actually of the tengi is the word they use for foundation, like the foundation of a house or something like that. And um, it's really about going back to the basics. And the basics is actually what Lama Zhang was debating you about earlier. The basics are refuge and bodhicitta. Okay? So this is where you mm, reassert your understanding and whatever your capacity is in that moment to trust in refuge and whatever bodhicitta you have in your heart you call it up okay and that's really what the foundation force is it lays the groundwork so that you can get back up again dust yourself off and move on right plant good stuff That leads us to number three, which is say Nienpo, Nienpo. Kunta, Kuntu, Kuntu. Chope, Chope. Top. Top. So Nienpo means an antidote, and Kuntu, Chope means some kind of activity, and Top, of course, means force. Um, so this is when you actually decide, so right, you've got, you've done this thing where you okay. I did the thing, and now I intelligent reg intelligent intelligently regret it, and now I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to apply the antidote. Okay, so the antidote is some kind of activity that you do to counteract the negative, the non-virtue, right? Um, and we're actually going to go over six different ways that we can do that. 
And I would say these are six different uh, classical ways that you can do it. And over the years, you'll find many, many, many ways to do antidotes. And you should have fun with them. But these are the six scriptural ways to do them. And uh, they're really awesome. So here comes the first one. Say, do de, do de. Do de. Sabmo la. Sabmola. Tempa. Tempa. So Dode means sutras, right? A book spoken by the Buddha. Uh, Sabmo means profound. No one here can tell me what profound is uh, a code word for. Emptiness. Emptiness. Oh. Yeah. What were you going to say, Sid? Perfection. Perfection. Well, that's another perfection there. You could say um, perfection, the perfection of wisdom. Anyways, yeah. So profound emptiness, right? And sabmo la tempa means to study the scriptures which teach emptiness. So tempa here means study, right? And that's the first classic makeup activity, right? And it's, it has to be very conscious. I would like, when I was doing uh, these kinds of things a lot, I'd be like, okay, um, my antidote will be scriptural study. I'm going to do one homework question. Right? And then I would go home and I would answer one of my homework questions. And that is scriptural study. This, these are based totally on scripture. So if you do a homework question, you are studying scripture in this lineage. So that's a great makeup activity. You know? and, and it has to, for it to, be, to work, it, it has to be conscious. I am doing this homework in order to nullify that karma. And then it will behave that way. Right. The second one, say, Tongpa. Tongpa. Ni. Ni. Kompa. Kompa. So Tongpa Ni means emptiness and Gompa means meditating. So we've got now we've got meditating on emptiness. So now this is the single most powerful antidote that you can apply. Um, no one here can tell me why studying emptiness would be the most powerful antidote. Because no one here can remember why it is the most powerful antidote. <laughs> so someone can remember. Sevi can remember why it's the most powerful antidote. It's the most powerful antidote because um, things are empty means that there's empty space inside things. No, it means something else. Yeah. So then you can't tell me why studying empty no emptiness is the most powerful antidote. You can't tell me. That's not true. You can tell me. Yeah. Sure. Uh, studying emptiness is important because um, when we get to understand that things are empty of self-existent, they don't exist in, in its own by itself, but they are empty of, of self on its own. Then we realize that things are changeable, they are not fixed. Um, You're getting there. It's good. And it's good so far. Because things are empty of itself, they can, we can get enlightened. <laughs> I don't know how to put it in Okay, so, no. okay. <laughs> so, uh, so things are empty of be ha having self-existence. So you're saying, so they, they can be, they're changing things. They can be, they, they have potential to be anything. It's good that it, that it's empty of itself. Because then there is the potential of, like, if we, if we were fixed, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to change our karma, then we will be constantly unhappy. Like, it means, means that if they're just the way we see they are, then, then there just wouldn't be a space for any change. Mm. There wouldn't be... 
Okay, let's consider. Consider. Um, consider. Let's see. Ocon. What's your favorite video game? What's your favorite video game? Minecraft. Minecraft. Let's consider Minecraft. It is. Um, Minecraft is fun to play and it makes you happy. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so Minecraft, so having Minecraft is a source of your happiness. Yeah. Oh, something else is a source of your happiness. Yeah. You can't tell me what that is. No. You can't tell me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you can tell me. Yes, you can. You can tell me. Show. Yeah. Oh, so because you prefer Minecraft over asteroids, Minecraft makes you happy. Yeah. And uh, because, because, okay, so Minecraft makes you happy, so if you went out and stole a copy of Minecraft and brought it home, then it was stealing Minecraft that made you happy. No. Oh, so, so stealing Minecraft is not what makes you happy, but you, but you stole it and you have it now. You st so stealing makes you happy. No. <laughs> stealing doesn't make you happy. No. So stealing, but well, but you have Minecraft now. You stole it. So stealing, so that means that has to mean that doing a negative thing leads to some good thing because you're happy. No. <laughs> no. So stealing, st stealing hasn't, doesn't have the power to make you happy. Yeah. Something else has the power to make you happy. Yeah. You can't tell me what that is. I don't think I can. You don't think you can. No one else can tell me the causes for uh, experiencing... You can. No one else can tell me the causes for uh, being happy. A cause for, for joy. No one, can, no one can give me a cause for joy. Because, it's, because stealing oh, gives you joy. Oh, 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 oh. No. oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. oh, we got a popper in the back? What? Yeah? Yeah? I yeah? think I can. Show! Sure. Sure. Show! Sure. Have the karma to like it? <laughs> you have the karma to like it. And why? And why? You can't tell me why you have the karma to like it. Because I have done something good. Oh, wait a second. What did you say? So you're saying that because you've done something good, uh -huh. then this game called is it called warcraft minecraft minecraft so this game called warcraft can, <laughs> can appear to you what's it called minecraft mindcraft yes. so this game can appear to you as something that gives you joy yes. so if you if you didn't have the causes in you for something to make you happy mindcraft could not do it <laughs> true true okay and that's because the joy of you experience while you play Minecraft is not being omitted from the game. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because the game is blank of self-existence. It is empty. So if you understand that, then you won't do foolish things to get this game <laughs> because right so if we understand that uh things are empty and we project onto them then we won't cheat on our husbands we won't lie in our taxes we won't tell lies to get things that we think are gonna actually um bring us pain or help us avoid I mean, bring us joy and help us avoid pain. And if we don't understand that, then that's what gets us into all the trouble in the first place. And that's why it's the ultimate antidote, because you understand the true causes of anything in your life. And so if you understand that, then you begin very quickly to wipe the slate clean of your negative karma. So you understand that you see the world because of the cause and conditions you put in the past that you're writing in yeah. the present moment. Yeah. Because 
Because everything, all suffering, the source of it is that basic ignorance that assumes that the world is coming at us and not from us. And once you can kill that basic gang leader of all gang leaders, that's it. You're home free after that. Then after that, everything just falls apart and the tapestry just falls apart and you become living in a beautiful paradise, happy all the time. Nothing else can do that for you. Not like that. That's why it's all negative. So I'll quickly say the third one, and, and then Lama Sherry will take us home for the last three. So um, the next one, number three, say Depla, Depla. Tenpa. Tenpa. So Depa comes from the word Da, which means to repeat something. So Depa means to recite over and over again. So this is specifically means reciting mantras. So reciting mantras can also be an antidote. And um, a lot of times they're referring to secret mantras. So like tantric mantras, right? Which we can't tell you about because they're secret. But we can tell you about um, the power of mantra because Master Dharma Kirti, in an open book on logic, he explains why mantras work. Um, and he explains that some secret words that you learn to repeat over and over again do have the power, can have the power to work, and two conditions need to be there. For a mantra to actually function for you, two conditions need to be there. One of the conditions is some kind of holy being has to have given you the mantra which means you can't make up the mantra yourself and decide this is a holy mantra unless you're already a holy being. Um, and the second thing that needs to be in place for that to work is that the person saying the mantra has to be, have a pure heart, which doesn't mean you have to be completely done. What it means is you have to be living a pure life as in you're watching your morality and as you're, you're not thinking uh, crummy thoughts as you have this, you know, incredibly secret, powerful mantra to do, you're not thinking uh, crummy thoughts and just allowing your mind to be crazy or uncontrolled, or because it, it, it won't work if you have a mind like that. So, if those two conditions are present, then saying mantra can actually be a powerful uh, antidote, and you can do miracles with that mantra. And one of the miracles that you can do with mantra is remove your bad karma. Yeah. I want to give them three mantras. Okay, give them three mantras. One of them actually is from Holy Lama Ji. Some of you may know this. Repeat after me. Om. 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 I. I. Have. Have. Enough. 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 Ahum. 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 That's a very, very powerful mantra to do when you're craving stuff. Om, I have enough. Ahum. Um, I'll give you another one that Holy Lama John put into a song. I, I love, love you. you. You repeat that over <laughs> and over. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Especially to someone who you don't think you love very much. It's a very, very powerful mantra. Last one. And this one I received from a very holy being who you may not see as a holy being, but you can try it on for yourself and it um, works for me. Thank, Thank you. you. So I would suggest trying <laughs> any or all of those three if you don't happen to have a mantra already from someone you see as a holy being, okay? Okay, the, uh, we're going through the six of the antidote forces from the sutra as spoken by the Buddha, right? So the fourth <coughs> one, say kusuk, kusuk. kusuk. la, la. temba. So kusuk means holy body, and la temba means the practice. These last three are a little esoteric. So this one is actually the practice of the holy body, and what it specifically refers to is painting, sculpting, building altars, anything that has to do with enlightened beings. And there's something really magical about to happen at Three Jewels over the next few months. There are formal tanka painting classes happening here, 
And tankas are these types of, of paintings. They're classic paintings of um, enlightened beings in the Buddhist practice of the holy body. And there's going to be classes here by a master named Kel Seng. So if you guys are interested, you can keep checking the website. But um, that's pretty cool because everyone who's participating in that is going to be doing the holy body practice. And uh, it's pretty, pretty powerful. The next one, say chupa. Chupa. La temba. La temba. Chupa means offering. And uh, la temba, right, is the same thing as we said before, which is the practice of offerings. So mm, this is the practice of offerings, which we also said was one of the preliminaries to purification, right? And if you remember the seven limb prayer that Lama John took you through in the, at the beginning, the meditation, do you remember that offering was one of the steps that you did? So I think beginning, middle, end, all the way through, if in doubt, make offerings, right? And then the last one, say Tsen, Tsen. La Temba. La Temba. Tsen means name. What does La Temba mean? practice the practice of yeah so this means to learn the names of holy beings and then recite them to recite a holy name so this kind of parallels in with the the mantra thing but if you um, recite a holy name but with those two precedents right like you have to believe they're holy and you have to be as pure as you can be when you're reciting them for it to work. And um, this actually refers specifically to a Buddhist practice called a yidam, which is a when you have um, a um, basically a deity that you feel is um, going to protect you or that you are aspiring to reach. They say, you know, you, you recite these names to call them to you, to reach them, but then ultimately to become them. So we're, we're encroaching on some secret practice here, but this is part of the open teachings. And um, a really useful one is to learn the names of your lineage lamas. And uh, there's a lot of them, if you've ever looked at that map at the bottom of the stairwell. <laughs> but um, it's actually useful to memorize. Okay, so that is the last of the third thing and actually i think we can do the last fourth and yep that's actually class so um should that do? yeah yes yeah. so i th i think we should just do that and then i do highly recommend that um everyone listen to the audio after the class because geshla gives some exquisite commentary all the way throughout. The audios are all available for free online through acidharma.org. We've really um, free-formed this particular class and riffed a lot because the, the actual core is the four forces, but um, we started late and I really think we can just go right to the last one there. So number four of the four forces, say Nyepale Learn Dokpe Tob. So Nyepa means bad deed. And Le Learn Dokpe means to restrain yourself. And literally it means to, to turn away from. And Tob means force, right? So this is um, to this is the force where you decide, okay, I'm not gonna do this anymore. With one important aspect of that is um, that you you're very realistic. Like if if for instance, like if you know there's a, a really heavy karma that you've done in your life, like a classic example would be like abortion or maybe uh, some heavy thing where you I don't know stole a bunch of money or something really heavy like that. You could say, okay, I'm never going to do this again for the rest of my life. But, and then you probably wouldn't be lying to yourself. But if you're going to be 
doing antidotes on smaller things like, okay, I'm not going to yell at that person. Don't add lying to your negative deeds. Be realistic and say, okay, you know, for the next 24 hours, I'm not going to yell at this person, right? And then for those 24 hours, you stay mindful and no matter what this person does or, or you know appears to you, you just don't have any kind of outward reaction, something like that. The mental ones are, are a little more tricky and a little more difficult. Mm, and you'll find like, like if you're trying to purify certain things like divisive talk or you're trying to purify like harsh words in your world and things like that, they all start with your thoughts first, right? And I know why I went through this thing where I was trying to stop hearing bad things and divisive talk and harsh words is one of them, you know. And you could, I have done this. I have done, I've been doing my book and I have swore in my head right in the middle of writing down the antidote. <laughs> right? Like sometimes you can, I don't know, I've been through periods of time in my life uh, where you're on a construction site or whatever and it's just like you hear the F-bomb like so much that it starts to become like in your head you, you say a lot in your head and I was trying to purify myself of those kinds of things and you'd be like okay for two minutes I'm not going to say the F you know or I'm not going to say that F and F right <laughs> and I'd be like ah right so you have to be very mindful and say okay for two minutes you know I'm not going to say I'm not going to have any profanity for two minutes if that's what it takes, right? So that then that time period can grow. And then eventually you can say, okay, I'm not going to say any harsh words for you know, 12 hours. And then you, that can be true for you. But um, so, you know, it's, it's a resolution. It's a resolution. Um, but the point is don't lie. Don't make lying part of it and, and just set a time limit, a realistic time limit. So that's that. There's just one other thing. Um, with karma, there's three different types of results that you can experience. And I know Master Shantideva does go through that in this particular chapter. Uh, you've had these in, in other courses, especially if you've taken ACI 5. But there is um, a ripened result, which is re usually referring to the type of birth you take. And then there is the similar result. Generally speaking, you know, another word for karma is habit. Because generally speaking, um, whatever we do by habit is a karmic result of having done it before. So, or you will experience for lying, for example. If you have the habit of lying, if you've planted the karma of lying, then you will have people lying to you or not believing what you say, right? Those are the similar results. And then another way that karma ripens is the environmental. Actually, it's not even just what you say, think, or do, or what is said, thought, or done to you, but the actual mm. world you live in. Like if you live in a world that is, if you live in a place that is really offensively dirty and filthy and stinky to you, that is the ripening of past sexual misconduct. If you um, are always constantly blocked from where you're trying to go, that can be with one of the ripenings of divisive speech or harsh speech if it's been, you know, if you're faced with particularly challenging obstacles, things like that, right? There's the environmental result. Um, crops, right, can grow and be beautiful and then, you know, the fruit falls off of the tree before it's edible. That's, that's a karma, that's an environmental result. So those are the three things we have to watch out for in terms of the way it ripens. And really, this whole class is about purifying so that you don't have to experience those things. But if you are experiencing those things, then you know what it is that you have to purify, right? And really, um, this is where we f have finally gotten to after learning about all of the preliminaries, after learning about all of the perfections. We went through all of the perfections also, right? The acts of a bodhisattva. And we want to really um, get to the, the root of what's causing us all of our suffering and what's causing us all of our joy because we want to perpetuate that too, right? 
We want to increase the joy and eliminate the pain. So in order to do all of that, we do need to get really, really good at purification. And what Lama John was saying about getting rid of his um, problems of harsh speech or hearing the, um, all the various negative manifestations of speech was by repeatedly being aware of it and trying to work as antidotes in that moment, right? So now that you know the four forces, you can do these at any time. The other thing, if you notice, if you, those of you who have taken the four forces before, these are in a slightly different order, right, than what we're used to practicing. This is from the original sutra. And in the way we practice it, we actually do foundation force first. And then we do the destruction force, the restraint force, and the antidote, right? But um, you know what? It's not so important what order you do them in as long as you do them. And that's basically class. Yeah, and just a couple of things I just wanted to say, too. Um, just because it's Master Shanti Deva, and he has this way of flushing out. Thank you for coming. Um, so remember the first of the four forces, right? It was like trying to get this regret going. And um, there's f four ways that we're supposed to go about getting th that kind of regret. And uh, it's a very interesting subject because we're supposed to be start to develop a way to um, develop regret just by simply considering the consequences of our negative deeds, right? So then you go over the consequences and then you and develop regret that way. That's one way. Another way of um, developing regret for our bad deeds is, cons is considering the moment of your death. Considering like, okay, you know, at the moment of my death, it's already going to be very crazy for me. What I don't want is to have all this on my mind knowing that I've done all these things and I haven't purified them and um, the whole idea is that Jason Kappa's dissertation on the practice of death is that if you do the purification practices right then you're ready to die you're like okay I'm fine you know if I die three days from now it's good I've taken care of everything that everything's straightened out right and we don't know when that is that we're gonna die so we should be taking this teaching, go home tonight, start picking out the ones that are the most heavy for you and begin to work on them because we don't know. We don't know, right? So that's one of the ways. And the other way, um, this is very interesting. I, I love this part. He says, um, another way to develop regret is by going over how it is that all the negative deeds that we have done we're done for meaningless things. In, in that, in that all the stuff that we do in, in our life, until you get to this mindset where you're thinking about beyond this life, is for the body, right? We're always doing things for our body. And we spend a lot of time, we spend money, and we've done a lot of negative things to get things for our body. Um, and that our body is like, it's like holding sand. It's just our body is disappearing from us as we speak. And there will be a day that the body is gone and all of those negative deeds that we did for the body will have been for nothing because the body is gone. But guess what? The body dies, but guess what doesn't die? The imprint of the deed that you did, which stays in the mind stream. You see, the mind does not stop. The body stops, the mind keeps going. So, so Master Shanti Deva is encouraging us to develop this mind that is, is starting to get intelligent regret for everything that we've done um, as if we were going to die now. Like, so like, do your homework so that at the moment when something goes down for you, you're already ready. Um, and then finally, it's just the practice of learning to fear negative actions. And... Um, he uses an example of um, he uses an example of someone that he saw in ancient India who was was sentenced to get his hand cut off because he was caught stealing. 
So he says, this young 20-year-old Indian boy caught stealing, sentenced to get your wrist cut off. And he's, in, in the scriptures, he's saying he's, he witnessed this as this man got dragged away, and he's freaking out and screaming. He's about to lose his hand for stealing. He's saying that um, at the moment of death, the, the, the mental anguish that you're going to experience is going to be about a thousand times worse because you're not just going to lose your hand. You're going to lose everything. So you're not going to be able to think straight. He said, do it now. Like, purify your negative karma now. And that's the whole point of really of today's class is, is that you get that thing like, oh, yeah, my mind will go on and everything that I've done for this thing is actually was meaningless, was for something in the end that is meaningless. So, um, yeah, then that's it. That's a class. Yeah? Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> it is it is actually a heavy class. Yeah, it's a heavy class. Really, yeah. really, really precious information. Master Shana Deva has a way of getting to the point in a very Yeah. yeah. Should we do it in uh, Tibetan? Tibetan, yeah. Sashi Kuki Jukshin Metok Dram Rilabling She Nyan de gen pa di sange shingu mi te uwa gi ro kunam da shing la chu pa shuk idam guru ratnamandala kam nire tayami ge wa di ke wo Sulam Yeshe Sok Zok Jing Sulam Yeshe Lei Jung Wei Tang Par Kuni Topar Shok